pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Summer Madison, position one. Chip Madison, position two. Phoebe Skinner, position four. Anthony Vieira, position five. Jordan White, chief of police. Uh, Anthony Pagano, administrator. Thank you. We're hoping Councilor Martinez will show up here shortly. And I have two. Did you get the proclamation? No. Okay. We have an additional proclamation that I will put as number three. Or let's make it two A under uh, after Holbrook Main Street. And it's for no health awareness. I think I'll get any complaints about that. And then um, I did a bad job of communicating with Administrator Pagano, and um, I wanted to talk to the council. Actually, I wanted to talk to the Urban Renewal Agency, but they're not available. So if the council would allow me to add to the agenda a discussion about uh, the former dangerous building and possibly talking to the Urban Renewal Agency about it, if we could add that to the agenda, would that be okay with the council? We should help me put it under number nine. All right. That fun stuff. We never do that. All right. So first up, sorry, I have too many screens open. Story of my life is the proclamation for voter safety. Safe Voting Week. For over 100 million Americans, voting continues to be a popular recreational activity from coast to coast and everywhere in between. People are taking the water, enjoying time together, boating, sailing, paddling, and fishing. During National Safe Boating Week, the U.S. Coast Guard and its federal, state, and local safe boating partners encourage all boaters to explore and enjoy America's beautiful waters responsibly. Safe boating begins with preparation. The Coast Guard estimates that human error accounts for most boating accidents and that life jackets could prevent nearly 83% of boating fatalities. Through basic boat boating procedures, carrying life-saving emergency distress and communications equipment, wearing life jackets, and attending safe boating courses, participating in free boat safety checks, and staying sober when navigating, we can help ensure boaters on the America's coastal, inland, and offshore waters stay safe throughout the season. <clears throat> National Boating Week is observed to bring attention to important life-saving tips for recreational boaters so they can have safer, more fun experience on the water throughout the year. Whereas on average, 650 people die each year in boating-related accidents in the U.S., and 75% of these fatalities are caused by drowning, and whereas the vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error or poor judgment and not by the boat equipment or environmental factors, and whereas a significant number of boaters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today <coughs> if they had worn their life jackets. I therefore, Tammy Kaufman, do hereby support the goals of Safe Boating Campaign and proclaim May 20 through 26, 2023 as National Safe Boating Week and the start of the year-round effort to promote safe boating. In witness thereof, I urge all those who vote to practice safe boating habits and wear a life jacket all times while boating. Uh, giving under my signature and seal of the city eagle basis, first day of March 2023. And would you guys like to come up and speak to this? I just remembered I did not turn my phone off, so doing that. Little <laughs> commander. Oh. Go ahead. Podium is there. That's right. Support crew. Podium is here. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm Pam Stalling. I'm the flotilla commander of our Chetco River Station 
Thank you. Barbara Rockford, I am the Vice Flotilla Commander. I've been in the Auxiliary 22 years, and promoting boating safety is a big part of our mission. My name is Linda Business, Staff Officer. I'm the Secretary of Recorder, uh, newest member, or one of the newest members to the Auxiliary, and uh, am a local Gold Beach resident. I'm very proud to promote boat safety. Boating safety. No, I'm not trying before I came. <laughs> in our local area. So. And our goal is to be up here at the boat ramp more this year for Gold Beach and doing vessel safety checks. And actually, we will be starting that May 20th. With um, our national safe boating. Yes, so. the beginning of boating safety week. I want to thank you for this. It's an honor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here, so thank you very much for your support. I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. I miss a lot of this stuff because people don't remind me. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. In addition to the vessel safety checks, we're also going to do more boating safety classes. Uh, great. In Gold Beach area too. But right. We also have them down at Brookings Chetco Station, so get, get the word out. Yeah, people are catching fish, so that means they're probably on boats. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next is a monthly update from Gold Beach Main Street. Who gets to be on deck? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, they're going to go together. Do you want to do the Center Falls Proclamation and then do Main Street? Because they've got a presentation to do. Who does? Main Street. They've got a PowerPoint. Oh, they have a PowerPoint. Um, is there anybody here for the proclamation? It's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> My name is Nick Mazaros, representing Gold Beach Main Street. Um, first, I would like to thank Council for welcoming Gold Beach Main Street to give our monthly review. Um, as most of you know, Gold Beach Main Street has been an organization for seven years now. Six of those years, we have been an Oregon Main Street member. In four of those years, we are grateful to say Urban Renewal has contributed to our community coordinator position. This past month, we have been without a community coordinator. Uh, during this transition, or this transition has shown to be a testament to our strength and commitment as an organization and a board. A lot of our time this past month has been spent reaching out to funders and consultants to explain our situation and strategize how we will bridge our gap and continue to thrive. First and foremost, <clears throat> Our board, each and every one, has stepped up to take on different responsibilities. Even though this is not a sustainable solution, we are all very proud of our unity and commitment to each other in the Gold Beach Main Street. Secondly, we would like the council to know that we have had overwhelming support from all of our funders and uh, very helpful guidance for our strategy moving forward. <clears throat> in this interim, we have hired one of possibly two grant writers needed to assist with securing grants. Speaking of connecting with the community and local businesses, we acquired the grant writer who works with Wally's House. And we are feeling very confident we will be successful with uh, upcoming submissions. In closing, uh, Lori will cover many of our past and current projects and accomplishments in her PowerPoint. As an organization, please know that we are always looking to leverage the dollars that Urban Renewal awards us annually. And for that, we say thank you. You're up. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised that you would have the PowerPoint? Oh. <laughs> well, now, in, in saying that, I have to say that I spoke about a year ago and I gave myself a D minus, so I'm going to do better this time. <laughs> and when I get done, I'm going to text the mayor and see what my grade is. <coughs> yeah. I don't think I graded you that low. Well, yeah, I, I graded myself that low. I think it was uh, keep it a little shorter. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there was more than that. There was a little head swiveling that wasn't good. <laughs> I'm now I'm nervous. I can't remember my password. It's a pin. So it's probably a number. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right. 
So first I'd like to thank the council, and I'd like to take, thank Chief White, and I'd like to thank Administrator Pagano for allowing us to do this. I'm going to try to move quickly and give you, since we haven't spoken with you in a year or two, about a 12-minute review of what we have done and what we are looking to do, and hopefully feel the support and, or not support and feedback on, on our direction. So with that said, we have been receiving $12,000 a year urban renewal dollars for Gold Beach Main Street. Uh, one or two years maybe was 13. Um, now with the cost of living and our need to combine funders to have enough money to pay a sustainable wage to a community coordinator, we're asking urban renewal for $18,000. So, um, and we want to show you now why we think that's justified in terms of what we do for our town. Um, so now let's go to, oh, down there, right? Administrator Pagano? Okay. So first program we want to talk about that we're all familiar with is Reimagine Gold Beach. Um, come on. Um, we're really proud of raising over $100,000 for a feasibility study. We had the, the county, the, think the city, thank you so much. Um, the Ford Foundation, we've had private donors, Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, all contributed wholeheartedly to this program in seeing the need for undergrounding and streetscape. Um, here's an example of a Ford-funded um, town hall meeting. You all remember going, and I really want to do apologize for the gigantic nameplates that you had. It was to honor you, not to scare you. But uh, anyway, there we are, and um, we had such amazing community engagement. We think not 130, but maybe 150 people, most of all which signed up to get our newsletter. So we feel great about the engagement as we move forward. Here's our first site visit, which was really exciting. We had all the utility companies. We had um, Spirit from Sanct Architecture. We had our Mayor Kaufman. We had um, Supervisor... Baxter, we had Administrator Pagano and all of us there to look at the challenges in the first round of going underground. Um, Consort used to be Murray Smith, they did the engineering project in Florence from beginning to end. You as, as councilmen vetted them to see that they felt they were credible to be the head of this project. We've been very pleased with their buy-in for us. Okay. Um, this is just a reminder shot because if you look at the top Screen. This, these are the poles we probably, most of us, don't see anymore. They're just uh, cluttering our town with wires and poles. Um, you can see that poor little banner up there, not very visible uh, in, in, in the configuration we have, but below, if we took away all the noise of the poles and wires, how our town would feel more cohesive. Imagine lamp posts. Imagine if we could talk the city into trees. <laughs> You know, the continuity from one mile-long stretch of our town would be gorgeous. To get people to stop, not just run right on through. Um, here's another reinforcer of our decision. We had a Sherry from Oregon Main Street, who's a wonderful consultant to us, say, hey, when you go to the nonprofit expo, put up a whiteboard and ask everybody that comes through, what's their number one wish? What, and to reconfirm that we're on the right track, 80 to 90 percent of everybody said, let's go underground. And so it was reinforced once again. Um, so we want to talk about projects and vision. Can I move you for one second? Yes. Can somebody close that door for me, please? Oh, thanks. I want to make sure everybody can hear you. Thank you, Tammy. I mean, Mayor Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing really oh, good. I'm in a bad break, break already. Okay. Um, we started with the what we call the pocket park, and it was in a sad shape. There was a lot of controversy of whether or not to improve it because it does attract a certain clientele. But we do have to say that, from at least our point of view, it's been a wonderful addition to the community, um, and we all own it and make sure that it's looking nice. And um, um, so we're ha really happy about that now. We came up with another brainstorm here. If, can you read those letters? It says, planter of bronze otter. So we're starting to think we have 10,000 left from uh, Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, Band of Dunes, uh, to put an art piece there. And when we read your urban renewal guidelines, it says have attractions that are a focal point within your main street. So we think, oh. And then we're reminded by Administrator Bogano that the mascot of the city is, in fact, an otter. 
So we turn to our wonderful resident architect. Where did he go? Oh. <laughs> and he draws for us to scale what an otter could look like sitting there. And guess where there's an otter? Gold Beach Books. So Art owns the bookstore, and it's a mother and a baby, and so um, Deb Trinan, Tree McNair, and I go in, and he says, oh no, beyond your reach, 45000 and we go, oh, oh, come on, come on. So finally, after a little hugging and whining and everything else, he decides he's going to let us have it at cost, 22000 for the otter. And so we've got a balance of funding to come up with if we all agree that this is a good direction to go, which we'd love to consult with the city on that, but we're very excited about the prospect. Um, I know we have personally talked with Mayor Kaufman for a number of years about signage and the need, need for weight for signage. And I, we love these three points. Showcase features unique to your city, enhance navigation and wayfinding, highlight key attraction and amenities. As we're trying to do things that provide continuity through this mile stretch, having signs that are all designed the same through town is a wonderful idea to make us more inviting, and we're really excited working with the city on that and working on funding for that. Then, um, Administrator McConnell, we talked with him about a, a paint facade program. We talked with Mayor Kaufman about this, too. Bannon has a phenomenal program, 50-50 with 50 loan, 50 grant, and if you choose one of the colors, which there's a wide array of colors, not, it's not confining, then you, can, you, you qualify to go into this program. So we like that where you're not demanding it, but you're offering it. And so we want to get together with Bandon and learn more about that, what happened. With them. Okay, so um, this is a funny out of the box one here. Um, Kyle Ringer from Chattoon and I were talking about our, our county seat and our our ugly cement box courthouse, and he says, oh my gosh, let's put Port Orford cedar planks between, uh, in the in recessed areas between all the windows, the big black lag bolts, and let's give more texture and dimension to the courthouse. And right about that time, um, who, is our, who is our judge? Um, Jesse. Jesse Margolis walks out and he goes, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we're gonna tear that down. <laughs> so this has kind of gone on hold. But it's something that we uh, would bring back up if, if, if we're going to keep the courthouse, okay? Um, you are familiar with this. You've all received um, our board member Nick's packet on the revitalization grant. Uh, we didn't execute properly here in 2023, but 24 we're going to really come in blazing with interacting with the businesses, understanding what kind of vision they have versus what we're suggesting, see if we can come to, come to an agreement. The grant is for $200,000. We've had a lot of support from Oregon Main Street, so we're very excited about that idea. Um, here's another one. I just, I just love this one, Nick. <laughs> I want, uh, what is the name of this building again, folks? Beach Mall. Beach Mall. Can you imagine? That's just uh, a beauty. And, and what about Crow's Nest? just think it's so cute there. And uh, this, this is a fun example of continuity of design where Nick has designed it with you know, the planks running across. The, what is that called up there, Nick, when you have? Um, it's not a header. Fascia. It's, it's not fascia? fascia? Is it a fascia? Okay. So um, anyway, with the planners below. So. Uh, so now we would like to talk about our partners and funders, which is a huge part of what we do and spend a lot of time on. And the um, first one we love and am very grateful for is Brent with the CEO of Coos Curry. He says, listen, we're going to help you identify the pipeline of grants for undergrounding. We might even be able to help you write the grants. You know, and as we know, ODOT's going to do a lot for our town, but they are not going to do anything involved with the cost of undergrounding. Okay, this is from Wild Rose Coast Alliance. It really speaks to our value system in terms of being connectors and collaborators and building capacity and strength and uh, engaging and building relationships. And the one that our mayor told me years ago that I've never forgotten and brings up is leverage. It's right down there at the bottom. See that guy? So that's what your donation to us does, is it gives us leverage. It gives us an ability to go after stuff because we have a community coordinator that's funded and, and, and secure the grants to bring money to our community. 
um, just went to um, SWAC, CCD, Coos Curry Business Development Corporation. You can see the gal in the red, that's Kim. She's a phenomenal guy, the, the gal that comes through town um, every month or so. Uh, and um, behind her is Lehigh, who helped finalize the grant applications for undergrounding. And then uh, Natasha in the, rock, in the white and Eric. They're from the workforce, and they have a program that will sponsor people that are hired in business on Main Street for three months and pay their wage for three months. The library, anywhere. The city. So it's, it's really an exciting program, and uh, we want to help connect to that and offer it to the community. Um, here's an example, Kim. We, these are two friends of ours, um, Merritt, that's a vet, and Patrick, that's a fish, fishing guide. They want to start a nonprofit and they want to um, take vets and seniors fishing both in the river and the ocean. So we think that's just a wonderful thing. And so they're putting together a business plan and applying for 5013C. And we feel wonderful in helping orchestrate that. Here's another one. We've talked briefly to Administrator Pagano about this. This is the Judith Ann Mogan Foundation. And when you see that orange slice, there's a million dollars going to Coos Curry and Douglas, and that orange is for kids. That's a good percentage, isn't it, of the pie. And <clears throat> whether or not the city would be interested in looking at that for, for the park, um, it's exciting to us if the city's excited about it. Um, the LOI is being made 15th, and we stuck a picture of Mark right up there on the slide because he's helping us with the grant right now and we've told them about the city, if they're interested, and we've told them about us because we're interested with help with funding with the community coordinator. He's excellent. His questions that he asks, you can just, he just zeroes right in on what the funder we're dealing with, what their perspective is, and what he needs to know about us to kind of bring this to fruition. So this is the kind of thing we see in collaborating with you with the city. You know, we maybe find a grant, you like the idea, we, we work together, we find a grant writer or the our community coordinator is the <coughs> one that can do it. Um, so here's another one that we that we really collaborate with, the Ford Foundation. I think Mayor Poplin, you know Michelle. She's phenomenal, so supportive of us. And is is there, she's there in the interim right now as we're transitioning into looking for a new coordinator. Max um, is um, also, he's the one that had the idea of listen to learn that we did with the, the dinners and the, and the lunches um, and he's very supportive so results we're going to go quickly now there's a little controversy on this one but uh, it, they're all over the state of Oregon and we're proud that we have an Oregon magic mural here um, and our, our our nine pocket parks here's one of them Nick's um, mom and stepdad help they've adopted this plot Cherie's been phenomenal in getting adopted plots through town that weed and water and fertilize um, and so um, we're very proud of that we feel like it makes a difference uh, the high school michelle helps with that to keep it moving forward and here is a picture of three mothers and daughters one of them sheree and her mom one of them for me and my mom and one of them cindy harwell and her mother so we have a memorial fish on all our benches and they're very dear to the people that have them. And a lot of times you'll see people put flowers on them on, on their parents' birthdays. Um, and I think Cherie told me the other day that, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to that way, um, that um, there's 15 on the waiting list for Memorial Fish. So it's been a very successful program. Quickly, here's Rogue at Door. And um, I think Jim Carrey and his family are on that one. And this was a wonderful you know, Summer's well aware of this and involved. This was a wonderful collaboration with our town of getting amazing press. I've been really impressed. I love travel and leisure and love to see them around more with it, with visibility. Top five of, and in the world for great, great beaches. Um, here's another result. This is the Banner program. It was funded by Travel Oregon. The city of Gold Beach gave 2000 <coughs> to this. And uh, WRCA. So... We're excited too. Sharon Flynn, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's an artist. She has phenomenal Christmas drawings. We'd love to have seasonal Christmas banners. And lastly, we've remodeled our office. We love our office. We're very grateful we have it. Our current grant that is going in is for operational expenses so that we can continue to enjoy this space. 
Um, this is where we met with CCD. This is where we want to start meeting with business owners to let them know about the new programs that are in place. And here we go. We, we looked for good pictures of, of the administrators here. <laughs> and darn it, I couldn't find Chief White with his wife or his dog, but you know, I tried. <laughs> And um, lastly, it's most important to know that your mayor's had a lot of good training. <laughs> <laughs> Never like those aprons, mayor. But anyway, so thank you so much for listening, and we appreciate all your support. Mayor, for saying you can take You got me ready. Okay. Oh, it was cute. It's not the blue rest. <laughs> <laughs> I do have that picture. You better watch out. <laughs> Coming to the future. In fact, I okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the council? Okay. And I believe grants have to go through to be approved by the administrator. Hey, we're still wondering <laughs> who's on first. <laughs> Since uh, Administrator Fritz left, we're still trying to remember who does what. It's almost all his fault. <laughs> so thank you. And I had one question. Go ahead. I had a question slash comment. So we were just in Seaside for the League of Oregon Cities um, Spring Conference and love the beautiful otter sculpture, but I'm thinking we might need a climbable one because even though people aren't supposed to climb on them, they will totally be climbing for photos, so it's something to maybe keep in mind. Well, what we plan to do, and that's a great feedback, thank you, is to put a pedestal so that we get it up. So they'll climb higher? Well, <laughs> <laughs> make it hard to climb. I was thank thinking you guys to be bronze or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like what do I know? You guys what, what did you say? Bronze or it is bronze. bronze. Oh, it is bronze. Wood. Huh? Looks no, like it's bronze. Uh, solid bronze. Solid yeah. bronze. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It didn't look good. It'll look so nice. Did it look like wood? Yeah. That's what I thought it was something else. Oh, yeah. Bronze. No, it's bronze. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mental Health Month Proclamation. There is a proven connection between good mental health and overall personal health. Whereas in one in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year, and whereas one in six U.S. youth aged 6 to 17 experience mental health disorders each year, whereas mental illness affects almost every family in America, and whereas people with mental illnesses can thrive if given the necessary services and supports in their communities, and whereas people with mental illnesses make important contributions to our families and our communities, and whereas stigma and fear of discrimination keep many who would benefit from mental health services from seeking help, and whereas research shows that the most effective way to reduce stigma is through personal contact with someone with mental illness, and whereas good mental health is critical to the well-being of our families, communities, schools, and businesses, and whereas a greater public awareness about mental illness can change negative attitudes and behaviors towards people with mental illness. Now, now therefore, I, Tammy Kaufman, Mayor of Gold Beach, on behalf of the city of Gold Beach, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2023 as Mental Health Month. As the Mayor of Gold Beach, I also call upon the Gold Beach citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental illness, reducing stigma and discrimination, and promoting appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental illnesses. Thank you for bringing that forward, Councillor Skinner. All right. Thank you for printing the agenda for me, sir. Okay, next up is the Beacon Broadband Franchise Agreement. You try saying that three times fast. <laughs> okay. I'm going to let the administrator for Gong start. So, at the April Council meeting, we had presented, or we were planning on presenting to the franchise agreement. Uh, Beacon wasn't available to review it, uh, so we just left it in the packet. So, you had it in the last month's packet. It's the same this month, except for the two corrections that Councilor Skinner found. Um, so, those have been changed, but everything else is the same. 
Okay, any discussion? Uh, we should probably go in order. We'll start with Councillor Bradley. Mm. No, we got Councillor Skinner? No. Councillor Vieira? Um, he's here, so I can ask him a question. Uh, what's your name again? Sorry. Paul Rankin, so I'm general manager of Eaton Broadhead. Thank you, sir. Um, you might come up to the podium. We are one of the big pieces here. Um, we've all had a chance to read through the franchise of Um So we're kind of looking at just discussing the one million, two million option. Is there anything that you would like to add to that to tell us? Like a necessity for a single meeting adoption versus just a regular two meeting adoption to give folks time Thank to review it. Mayor and Councilor, we, we do not have today a sense of urgency. If you, if you want to use a two meeting methodology of, of, of adopting the franchise agreement, which I know is a, a standard methodology to do a single model, you have to do two readings today and some other things of that nature. Uh, we, we are not working, we are we're not going to be building in Gold Beach before your next council meeting. <laughs> as much as we would like to. <laughs> awesome, thank you. That was a great question. Uh, Councillor Madison. And I assume staff has all their questions answered. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you coming. So since there isn't an urgency, does the council want to do the two mission two meeting motion? We kind of, we, it was in the last meeting, this whole thing was brought up, so I don't know that we do need to bring it to the next meeting, that we could just do it in one meeting, because it was brought up in... Would you like to make a motion? I don't know if I should. You're on the spot now. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know if the others would, so I don't know if I should. I would prefer to do a two meeting adoption. Um, counting, not counting the last meeting when it was discussed. Right, right. Okay. Um, just because it wasn't something... Did I'm you sure. open public comment? Oh, is this a public meeting? Tell the comment. You are correct. This is a public hearing. Forget everything okay. you just said. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to open the public hearing at 6:35 p.m. for the Beacon Broadband Franchise Agreement. Thank you for the reminder, sir. Does anybody in the audience want to speak to the Beacon Broadband <laughs> Franchise Agreement? Mayor, Council, staff, and citizens, I apologize. I did not fill out the form to speak, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in behalf of the franchise agreement that has been proposed. Again, for the record, my name is Paul Reckonzone. I am the general manager of Beacon Broadband. I'm excited to be here on a night when the Main Street organization presented uh, a report. Uh, the Main Street organization is directly engaged in the vitality not just the economic vitality, but the arts vitality, the life vitality, and the economic vitality of the community. Beacon Broadband feels the same way. We're building this network not because we think that we're going to make millions of dollars, not because we think that, uh, that Gold Beach is a target for acquisition for our profit. Uh, we're building this network because we're deeply engaged in the economic vit vitality of the region and of the city. And so we strongly encourage adoption of the franchise agreement, and if we can answer any questions, we're happy to do so. Thank you, sir. Um, anybody online that would like to speak? It appears that there's only Stephanie who never wants to speak. So um, anybody else in the audience that want to speak to this? Hi, yeah. Beacon Broadband? Yeah. <laughs> no. That's the subject. <laughs> No, I had a, I just came in to compliment your staff, uh, starting with Kim and Tim and uh, the other young man, the tall with a beard, water uh, helper. I have a problem with a little bit of water uh, at my residence. And one phone call to Tim and, I mean to uh, Kim. <laughs> anyway, I just came by to wish, thank you, I should probably write a letter. Do you want to state your name for the record? Oh, Gene Trinkler. That's what I thought it was. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for coming in. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, and thank you, Anne. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Anything else on Beacon Broadband? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing at 637.
Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion? Um, I will. Councilor Beer. I make the motion that the council adopt ordinance number 685 and approve the first reading by title. A second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I will call for questions, starting with Councilor Bradley. Aye. 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 Councilor Mass. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Administrator Pagano, would you like to read the title? Or would you like me to do it? Either way. Okay, I'll do it. Um, in and for the city of Gold Beach, State of Oregon, Ordinance Number 685. In the matter of Ordinance 685, an ordinance of the City of Gold Beach granting Beacon Broadband, Inc., its successor and assigns grantee a franchise as described herein for all cable and telecommunication service purposes within the City of Gold Beach. My title. Did I do that right? You did perfect. Thank you. Okay. And we all learned last meeting that Councilor Martinez, who couldn't be here tonight, is the best at reading. <laughs> Next up, uh, any, we didn't have any citizen requested items of the Mr. Sprinkler. Um, this is the time for anybody in the audience that wants to speak that you can speak for three minutes on just about anything you want. We do ask you to keep it kind and polite. I don't see anybody, so now we've passed the ordinance, so now we go to the consent calendar. Questions on the consent calendar before we. On page 21. Page 21. Oh, I wrote the number but didn't write the thing. I think it's maybe <laughs> the parks or the visitor center. It says it's there's a $300 amount that puts it at 2,543%. And I wasn't sure. Okay, I finally found the page. So the 23,000. <laughs> You're talking about the debt services? It's a negative amount. Well, and here I don't know why that just seems really off. But I don't have books, so that just seems weird. What page is it? 21 at the bottom. What section? It's actually in the middle, but it's the net total community promotion fund. It's a negative number. Okay. I'll have and one of the problems with our accounting system is it does not include our beginning fund balance. So sometimes it looks like we overspent, but we have money left over from the year before. So that could be part of it, but we shouldn't be that far off at this time of year. even the budget. Right? Yeah, it doesn't look like it's right. Yeah. Do you want to hold off on approving it or just bring that to light for further research? I think it probably just needs to take a look back. Okay. You have that in your notes, sir? I do, I do. Okay, fun stuff to talk to your bookkeeper about. Okay, any other questions or comments about the consent calendar? If not, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. I'll second that. Okay, motion from Councilor Madison, seconded by Councilor Skinner. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll start with Councilor Bradley. Aye. 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 She did it. All right. I'll get another four to zero. All right. Next. Uh, is the residential SDR being short term rental uh, enforcement? So, Councilor Pagano has brought to our attention that the council decided to drop from 17 in the residential zones to 15, provided staff no idea how to actually do that. And so, he's given us three options of which he will tell us that two are no longer available, 
And <laughs> I'm wondering if the council wants to go back to just having 17 until one of them close to make it less stressful on staff. So we drop from 21 down to 15, and we have currently have 17. So these new rules will become enforced the new at the beginning of the fiscal year. So we don't know how to proceed. Do you guys want to amend that to 17? Drop it to 15, keep it at 15, or would you guys like to do any of these other options and let us know how to enforce the new number? Um, when the original um, resolution came through, wasn't it whatever was acting, we just set a, a barrier of, of entry that was required prior, correct? So could we just proceed that same way? It seemed to work fine. We're you allow for it to be technically an overflow, but um, that means that three have to leave before the next person comes in. And um, previously, I know it was, I think, first on the list. Um, it sounds like most of the places we have are starting to wean themselves out. It was one of those things. It was the hot market. And, uh, and so now the, the places that are probably maintaining, I'm thinking, are on the higher end, or at least they do a very good job inside their unit. Um, so, was there any staff level issues that anyone had worked for that process previously? I know you weren't on it then, but um, was there any like complaints or warnings? Um, I don't know. I remember from the discussion that if we said 15, it was going to be first come, first serve. So if there's 17, two people aren't going to get a chair. And then, so I'm okay with that. That was my understanding when we changed it. Um, however, an interesting point came up at the conference was that there were people getting short-term rental permits in different municipalities to prevent people from operating short-term rentals. So I would say that if people are not act actively renting out their space, that might be something we look at, or maybe we let people make their own decision on how they get permits, but it was an issue I hadn't thought of until I was at that meeting, that people would be doing that to block something. So with the three options that we had come up with was first, first in, first out, whoever, I mean, we open it in June 1st, whoever the first people are with the 15 to apply, that's who we give them to. But then you have somebody that wants to mail it in, it's like, how, I mean, do we go by postmark? So we're, we need, if, we, if that's the way we're gonna do it, we need headway on how to do that. Um, the option two was most actively used and option three was the highest TLT. Now that we have our stuff done through the state, we don't collect it anymore, our TLT funds, we don't have a way to track that. So we could take quarter three and see who was most productive at that point, and then those could be the ones we wanna do. So we just need headway, if you wanna keep it at 15, how you want us to enforce that. Because people are not happy. <laughs> Just a <the> forewarning. <laughs> and then the other option would be it's 15, but we are letting the other two stay. We would just amend that number to 17. So we would amend it. It wouldn't be an exception. It would have to get changed back to 17. We've never had it at 17. That's just how many we currently have. Oh. Um, so. Uh, for clarification, um, well, Councilor Barry, you said in the past when we were at 21, um, we were allowed to have a little bit over. Correct. And then when they closed, then we wouldn't replace them until we got under. Correct. And so it was a it was a bar set that was not. Um, it it didn't force anything. It just prevented. Um, coming back into it. So if, if our city says it's going to maintain 17 vacation rentals, um, then our city can maintain 17 vacation rentals and we can still say that we only want 15 um, if we allow them to grow in there. Um, because obviously if someone has a very successful vacation rental with the way that the code's written that doesn't allow for transfer of ownerships or anything like that, um, you know, they're looking at selling the unit, that means they're completely cashing out. So they're not even gonna be looking at going and picking up another location in that scenario, um, especially when they're already maintaining one. So the, the idea of putting a limiter um, is to prevent that overflow um, that happened 
and and I think it's probably just something that gets revisited all the time uh, to say what we need or don't need. Um, knocking down a couple of them sounds like, a, especially with like a first come first serve or, or in any format like that, I feel is um, at that point it's almost too much of an overreach by us. Um, I think they can, obviously they, they balance themselves out from the initial large section that we had, because um, I believe it was 25. Said a number, or I say we, the council said um, a number at 21. Um, and then they, they were going to adjust, and there was there was a brief period where everyone was on the list because they were like, oh, there's no opportunity anymore, but it seems like everything's balancing out. I'm sure most of these are probably contained um, on the south side of town. I can, I can think of one or two in the middle of town, but um, you know, they're already calling to those kind of locations. We also don't have the park hotel. Um, they're working on rebuilding that. It wasn't open for business for the last year and a half. Anyway, so nobody go, you know, pitchfork and torch on those folks. They're trying to they're trying to remodel and bring something better to our area, I think, I hope. Um, so yeah, I, I would say just treat it the way it worked last time. I don't see any issue with that. I don't remember if the resolution had anything that stated it had to be put at 15 and that you could only have the 15. Um, if that's something that's in there, I would say next meeting, let's say, let's make a revision for that and, and proceed that way if everyone's in agreement to that. Okay, so I'm hearing two, two ideas. One is first in, first out, just keep it at the 15. The other is we allow the 17 to be non conforming and we have to double check if you wrote it up the right the first time. And any other ideas from this side? No, my memory can serve me right. Backs up what Council Bureau was saying when we originally passed it, that the concept is if we were over the number when it got set, that they'd be basically grandfathered in, and nobody, we just wouldn't allow any new ones until we got below that number. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think because along 101, we've got, um, dual zone at least one block east and west of, of 101 and leaves a lot of room for uh, vacation rentals in the residential zone. Really the trend we've seen is a push for uh, transient or STRs in the commercial zones. Um, and so to just say, well, we have 17, we really have a whole lot more than that. Um, and really when you're going um, one block, especially when you go east of 101, um, that's still a lot of housing that could be taken up by STR. So I'm really comfortable with the 15. But when we're looking at, uh, I mean, I think honestly we need to, you know, consider what's most fair and equitable. Um, at first, you know, I'm like the first in, first out just doesn't seem fair. But honestly, when we're looking at these other two options, I, I'm not sure that it's not the best option. Um, most actively used, uh, priority given to rental properties being used the most. Well, is that because they um, know how to market promote? And if they don't, is that something we should be doing a better job of? Um, the highest till T obviously is going to come from the biggest homes with the greatest views that aren't typically owned by folks locally. So um, that's a concern to me as well. Uh, but what I think would be prudent, do, do you really need a decision tonight? No, I need a decision by the time we go. We're at May, I'll need it by the June meeting. Okay. Because we want to have it officially yeah. out. Do you want to be on June 1, right? Yeah, well, well, we'll open the date next whenever you guys tell us to. Hmm. I don't want to open it now because we'll have everybody coming in right now and we're not even ready for them. Well, I'm wondering if we can't take a look at a map, because I know oftentimes um, the congestion of an STR really rubs um, neighbors the wrong way. Um, maybe it's adding to a congested part of the uh, town, maybe up just off 3rd Street, which I know we have one close there. Um, would it be fair to look at a map and see where those are located currently? The 17 that are in the residential zone? Mm -hmm. Current. Dr. Beer. Uh, 
I want to touch on that piece. Well, two parts. So the first one is the review process. Um, one of the big nomenclatures that was included in that was, is there a traffic issue? It's like one of the unit numbers on there, if I'm remembering correctly, for uh, conditions of approval that came through for the residential units. Um, so if you go back and look at a bunch of them, most of them have something in there that states that the average flow for that road is probably good. Um, I don't know if we've had any specific complaints, but there's that. And then the second part is, um, you know, we, we're making a change, but, um, you know, folks, folks are purchasing properties. Yes, it's in the residential zone. Yes, we want to have long-term housing, but they were making a business decision. Um, and that was 100% within their right when they made that decision. And if our adjustment damages someone in their active uh, business, then I think we are overstepping ourselves. Um, saying we're not going to allow new ones is, seems perfectly fine to me because you're saying we're not going to let more in. That's something that everyone's coming into the game knowing. But if I personally had purchased a property uh, a year ago, and I said, okay, I'm going to make it into a vacation rental, but, you know, maybe, so I'm, I'm the last guy in the game, um, I am renovating the space to make it more applicable to being a vacation rental, then, um, you know, I'm, I'm making investments, maybe I have a contractor working in my space or something of that nature, um, so now my TLT doesn't show that I did a good job because I'm, I'm not functioning. I'm kind of down for renovations, so to speak. Um, I, I just, I would not be comfortable with the city plucking um, things from folks that have already basically signed up. Um, and if that was the intent of the um, original resolution, I, I place blame on myself for missing that and not saying something. Okay. Um, so, could you refresh on that detail of how we set the number at 21, there were 25, how did the verbiage go out to people saying that this is our number, so you have this vacation rental for now, like, so we'd be two over with the situation at hand, two away from our target. So, originally it was everyone who had one was sent a, this is the new packet, this is the new process, fill out your paperwork, um, you guys are, you guys are, are grandfathered and you have this time period to get it submitted, to get your stuff done. If they failed to submit during the time period, they were removed from the list. If the list dropped low enough, people were welcome to put themselves on the waiting list, and it was a collective waiting list. Um, sorry, not to steal. The, no, there. you were here. I, I was working in the front office at that time, so um, so that was one of the people. I was wondering how you used to well, remember it. <laughs> the city will always have it. <laughs> it have a short we're sure of it. Um, and so, so with that in mind, that's that's the process that went with it. Um, part of that, I think, was to do a little bit of enforcement. There was a time there when people were just opening them. There was no requirements. They didn't do anything. It was, you know, it was yeah. it was something. And so the process right now, would they, they would have to come back and get their permit for 2023, 20, 24, and all 17 could come back and ask for that. We're not saying that all 17 would come back to ask for that. So we might not even have a problem, exactly. or we might be too over. You got it. So uh, I'm going to be opinionated tonight. Uh, I'm not always opinionated. Uh, I was more opinionated when I sat over there. Uh, <laughs> Like I, I, I like to protect our staff and not have them get yelled at, and so I, I kind of like uh, Councilor Vieira's idea, and um, it would give staff time they could get in the next week or so, they could let people know that if we don't get them back by July 1, that you're not going to get renewed because we're only doing the current 17. Um, and then after that, we're going to drop to 15. Uh, that keeps staff from being the bad guys. And they can blame us because people don't see us as often until they catch us in the grocery store. Um, so I kind of like that idea to, to follow that suggestion, which I guess is what we did last night. And so that there should be a template for that so staff can replicate it. 
if the council can live with making that decision tonight, if we wait till next month, then people aren't going to have a whole lot of notice because they got to have their permit by the 1st of July, right? right? So can the council live with that kind of idea? I can. Is that what is is that? That will be what's easy. easiest for your staff right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So, yep. can I ask Councilor Vieira to make a motion? Ah, uh, yes. Um, all right. Oh, I, um, I make the motion that the council direct staff to proceed with resolution R two 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 three dash zero seven. Um, that lowered the amount of vacation rentals in the residential. That's going to make it um, To omit that, please. To 15, um, but to allow for the existing 17 to reapply within a given time frame, which is what July 1st. Is that what we were saying? Would it be June 30th or July 1? Uh, June 30th, it didn't expire. So, prior to June 30th. So, that's good. Prior to when? June 30th. What is the current fee for that permit? Uh, they have the $88 business license and then the $200 endorsement fee. Okay, is there a second? I'll oh. second. Administrator for the final word. I will listen to the recording. Are yes. you feeling comfortable <laughs> reading that? <laughs> I can paraphrase it, I think. I can paraphrase, yeah. but I'm not okay. going to be able but to. We're on the, I think we're all the same, but, but the, uh, by June 30th, if you don't apply and you're in that 17, you don't get one. When we really? get down to 14, then somebody new can come in. Yeah. Well, grandfather, the way it currently is, everybody that's at 17 can stay, but as soon as somebody drops off, the, yeah, we get down to 15, that's where we stay. You're on the same page? Okay. So, uh, any discussion? Then I'll call the question. Councilor Brad. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Just so you it's know, you made two two. I could have voted. You made Shelby very happy tonight. <laughs> oh, is that her job? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Really <laughs> um, after the fact, who does the code enforcement for that? Those. Uh, which I've got to say, keeping keeping a certain number means that we don't have to flex on the amount of time the staff has to do all of that. But who does the enforcement of um, the things required of the STR owner in the application? Shelby, do, Shelby and Tim both do the site visits, and they go through their checklists. And if there's something that's missing, they don't approve them. And then Shelby also goes on to like Airbnb, VRBO, all those places and checks for new ones. And then if somebody does pop up, then we send them a you're not in compliance and you just stop letter. So if, if they're not in compliance on the checklist, do they have a certain amount of time to um, make good on that before they're ineligible? No, because if we already went through the process with them, then they are in compliance. These are like okay. the ones that just sign up and go on Airbnb by themselves. Okay. Then How often are they checked? Once a month. Because there's a, when you apply, there's a different permit than the yep. endorsement, right? It's yep. like a conditional use or something. They just have the application. Basically, yeah. yeah. They, so they're, they're, they're checked monthly on Airbnb to see if anybody new signs up without having a, without going through the process. And oh, check the sites. I mean the actual yeah. site. Not we the website. The, the website. property. We check the, we check the properties themselves when they first sign up. Just once? No, we will go back. How often? When they apply again. So each year. And just for clarification, it's it'll, an outright use of the zoning code, so it's not a conditional use permit. It's just a business code that regulates. Oh, All right, that actually. Yeah. So, yeah. I just, that was very clever. One more question, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way, because oftentimes you'll find um, STRs are more intimidated by the state than a city. If because you do your collection through the state, if will they do the collecting for you, if they would offer up uh, the list of who they collect from in the city that we that you may not be privy to. So they won't share a list with us. They just tell us how many they are mm -hmm. of each type. So we know how many short-term rentals, how many motels, how many RV parks, that kind of thing is the report we get. 
uh, but they also are consistently weekly checking that report of, of who are those websites of who signs up. So they know, they find them before we do some of the times, and they send them the notification that they the state does it by themselves too. So with the event center follows through on developing their RV park. Is that going to impact these numbers? We'll get chill team money, yes. But it won't have anything to do with, short, with the short term rentals. Okay, good. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Next up is. Oh. Oh. Yes, oh. Council. Are you here. going to. We didn't talk about the idea of if people are just getting permits, they'll hold them. Is that going to be part of a conversation to see if they're actually doing a business, or is that not? I don't even know. It just came up in the conversation, and I thought it was interesting. They have to be actively rented. So if they're not, I mean, if they just throw them up once in a while, then we're not going to give them a license. They need to actively be renting them as a vacation rental. So that's part of the review when they yeah. reapply? Okay. Yeah. Business opportunity. Okay, draft proposal for HB 3115. I'm tired of this conversation, but we have to keep talking about it until we're done. <clears throat> um, we're calling it unsanctioned sheltering. Not my favorite term. <laughs> but um, does the council have any uh, questions or comments on the suggested language? And I think I'll go in order and start with Council Bradley. I know he loves to be on the hot seat. Oh, it's easy. Oh, wait, Councilor Bergano would like to introduce. It's not Councilor anymore. Um, so, <laughs> oh, Administrator Bergano. It's all right, we'll trade your seats for this one. Okay? <laughs> so this is one that I had taken drafts from each one of the, uh, the ordinances and stuff that I had sent you. So this is, change, feel free to change anything, the, the, the title of it. If you don't like it, change that. You're not going to hurt my feelings whatsoever on any of this stuff. This is just stuff that I came up with that I thought would limit as much as possible without limiting everything. Mr. Hot Seat? I'm happy with it as is. Okay. Councilor Skinner? Um, I'll take Chip's words space, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure about the shelter. I'm not sure about the title. Okay. Um, I was just in Grant's past and I'm just very hesitant on words and intent and I'm not sure what a title could be, but I wasn't 100% sold on this one. Um, in section five, in section five, the limit is on 5B, occupancy is limited to three or fewer vehicles or tents at the same time in any combination. On a larger property like the Baptist Church parking lot, three would it could feasibly do more. So I was looking more at section C with the spacing and the density requirements and thinking we might be able to increase that number on B or take B out and just use density somehow with the feet apart. Um, that way determining different property sizes that way versus putting a number on it. The other piece, we could still definitely put a max on it, um, but I thought just the universal three didn't seem logical. On number 12, final sentence, the city or its personnel are not responsible for the correct person claiming ownership of subject property. I know other municipalities have been ahead of us in this, and I don't know if that is the same language people are using, but that made me nervous as somebody who could at some point in her life potentially be homeless, and someone else could be like, oh yeah, that's mine, I was in that same camp, and I know that she had that way cool thing. Uh, so that made me feel nervous. Also, it made me nervous sitting on this dais with somebody coming after our city saying you basically stole from us, you gave us away. So I'm not sure on that with the legal precedent in the cities that have come before us. So that's why it was added, is because there's no way we're going to be able to identify whose stuff is stuff, especially when we have it stored. 
Is that what other cities have done? This was what I came up with. That was for our protection, not what other cities have So I would be very curious to see what other cities have done, because while I fully understand that it's going to be next to impossible to make sure that item A gets matched with the correct person, I could find, I feel that there could definitely be somebody who would take person A to the city and say, it doesn't matter what you wrote in section 12, you did something. So I just would really want that to be looked at okay. um, with the legal lens that I don't have. Um, number 13 also is a hard one. Um, the end with, is it 13 or 14? 14, it's 14, which puts on our police an interesting piece, and Chief, you might want to speak to it, but the items which reasonably appear to be either stolen, like how do you judge if something's stolen or not? Like there's a lot of people who might be newly homeless or might have had something of value that is theirs, so I don't know how you make that judgment as in, yeah. The judgment's made on, uh, usually it's defaced property, so um, chainsaw with the serial number uh, scratched off, or obviously personal markings that had been on an item that had been removed. So once we see that there, it's, it's something we look for and see, and it's very evident when we come across it, and in that case we seize it, because even if it goes back out, it becomes you know, a defaced issue and it's against the law in many yeah. cases to, Could we to use own that something language? that's had the serial number removed. Could we use that language, defaced or demarked? Um, I just, I actually, this language is common is that, and it's okay. It's, it's up to us to articulate what it was about that that okay. led us to believe that based right. on our training and experience. Okay. And then the 15 on the fire piece, is that permit the same as my burn permit, where someone would go online and get it, or is that a different kind of permit? That was the, that's what we were going with. That would be the same, where they'd have to go online? So they'd have to go to the library or use data? Or come in here and fill out where they're going to be burning. Or there's a paper copy. So accessibility, there's a paper copy? Yep. And then, that might, oh no, sorry. That's not, I was like, I think that's it. I wouldn't know where I could go based on this. Yep. So I don't know, back to you, Chief White, I don't know what you would say if you can't be here. If we were to, if we were to have this, at some point we do need to be able to either have a map, even if it's for our own officers to for people to know where they can be that is, that is uh, I mean this the language in this and where it, it really does address most of the issues we, we commonly get complaints about in the areas but it would be something we would need to if this was something we were going to move forward on we would want to identify the public properties that are outside of these spaces so at least the community and council were aware of what those spaces were. Well, and I would hope that the people needing a place to rest, sit, lie, or whatever would know where those spaces were too. Yeah, we usually have to explain, you know, where their options are. So I don't know the, I think I've been to one too many League of Oregon Cities meetings and watched one or two too many news stories. I don't know how this moves forward without demarcating where somebody could be in the actual ordinance. And I don't know, because I haven't watched, probably I've watched one too many and not enough at the same time. So with just the city, city owned properties only, this narrows us down to four different locations that they can go. Okay. Um, count, there's still gonna be multiple other public properties that are gonna be, uh, I don't know how those entities are gonna deal with it. Uh, this all was reviewed by our legal counsel, so everything in there, they okayed. 
Right. And this is still leaving four different spaces for them to go that are city public property. So you have the tools to tell people where they could go when you're interacting with them? Too we move forward with this, yeah, we'll have a way to let them know. Those and the places. legal counsel went over all of it, including that one piece about the um, the property of the wrong person, that piece. So the yes. legal counsel saw that. So then my only question then, I guess, for change would be looking at Section 5 with the three. The density. With the three. And then that density, like playing with that to see what would be what would be the best way. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, Councillor Vieira. All right, I'll work backwards since you're already on the page. Um, so for, which isn't on here, but for notification of folks to let them know where they can be, um, from like a code enforcement standpoint, providing a copy of this section would be considered adequate um, in that grand scope. So I don't see why within the purview of that, a, a copy of the <coughs> unsanctioned shelter code provided at time of movement if there would be a spot for officers to be able to maintain that and say, hey, you got to move along, here's your information on it, you know, that could be something that's included in there. Um, and that would be more of a, a legal protection than anything else. Like a packet? Yeah, like I mean, it's two pages for this, so um, if in the future there's a, a mapping system that's decided on, then you can continue on that route. Uh, but prior to that, notification via just the, the written code here, you know, this is this is designed to direct folks, um, and that's the intent of it. So, providing it to someone is the same thing as providing them a, a piece of nuisance code that says you have a dangerous building because you're a dangerous building part. You're in infraction of subsection, you know, section C, whatever, whatever. Um, so there's that. Um, Thinking on it, I would say probably 15 is uh, fires are prohibited. Um, Senate Bill 3551 specifically states that fire and warming fires are not considered a protection. Um, that's the state's words, that's the state choices, um, and, and we should confirm that, but I believe that it states directly on there. Um, it was a conversation that I had a little bit with the fire chief on what that looks like and, and what that looks like for the fire department. Um, so I would I would shorten that to fires are prohibited, um, which would be inside of unsheltered um, spaces there. Generally, it's a requirement for the permit to be from folks that are the property owner. So if the property owner has a burn pile space or a, um, a yeah, a fire pit or a uh, burn barrel or something that they say, hey, these are welcome to, you know, throw some material in here and, and warm yourselves there. That's the prerogative of that property owner, but I would, I would rather not see that on public lands. Um, so there's that piece. Moving up um, for the retention of people's goods, I think we have to have it it stated in such a way there's there's just I, I couldn't possibly imagine a good way of saying is this your stuff or not your stuff um, and then to retain it and go forth on that um, the entirety of that bill was stated that it has minimal to no financial impact and the most impactful piece I can think of is categorizing and uh, labeling items to say, okay, when somebody shows up for this, it's got to be this person. Now, that's not to say that we don't have them in a section and it's like, hey, you guys took my phone. Okay, what is your screen saver? Are they just going to guess? If they get lucky, they get a free phone. I, I don't think anyone's going to make that big kind of a jump. Um, and it's not stuff that's out on display for where we're keeping it, I would hope, um, probably. It's, it is not an issue. Okay. I mean, people, people know their stuff and they describe it. And if we, they'll, they'll describe enough circumstances that we feel comfortable releasing it. Okay. And if, if they're pulling our leg, we know it. If, and then they're trying to pick up somebody else's property. 
it becomes very obvious. They're not great at scheming up a great line. Yeah. And these are folks we deal with regularly. I know what their stuff you is know better than they do. Right. So. And I'm sure the police report probably states where the items were found. We usually of. had, we've even reviewed proper intakes on previous occasions, body cam footage showing their property and reviewed as we tried to identify and separate things out. So we have, it's not really a problem. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I think that's just a, a legal protection so that yeah. if something does come down the line and say, well, I mean, we said that it's not our piece. There's, you know, there's, there's a piece in here that says you need to, to move it along in um, 72 hours, even one item at a time is, you know, folks, folks don't usually have a whole lot of stuff. And then you start getting into the car piece. And usually it's a full car that pulls into a spot. And then, you know, part of this is to protect us from that where they can out. They can pinata out, I suppose. Um, and everything goes everywhere. Um, so then we get to, uh, what was I going to do next? I'll jump up to the parking space. Um, I see an issue in overlap there. So our land use requires that the use of your building, the use of, of your land is associated to your parking spaces. Um, so that's the total number of parking spaces you have. So. If we want to put something in there that is going to say you can't be below what the use is, that sounds like a big staff commitment at that point to say, hey, you know, you only have 14 parking spaces, and in order for you to be a furniture store, um, you need all 14 spaces, which means you wouldn't be able to allow for that use. Um, and, and additionally, those are those are spaces for cars, so. So for car parking, I mean, that's that's a person's business, so they would be able to allow that, but I don't think you need to openly state that. Maybe the limit is still good on that. So they've got to be at least 200 feet away from how it currently is. They'd have to be 200 feet away from 101, so they're not going to be out of business. They'd have to be away so from that. So it would just be a random... So it'd be, it'd be at a house it would, or a church or something like that. It wouldn't be at a okay. business where we're distributing spaces. Okay. So like like you said, a okay. restaurant has to have a sign a certain amount. This wouldn't take up any of those spots. Okay. Yeah, I would just fight for not seeing it um, denominate parking spaces as an allowance just in general. Okay. Um, in the same way that we kind of come to the conclusion that maybe camping on the sidewalk is not the best decision for folks to do. Um, it's got an intended use, it's an intended space. Uh, making the argument for grassy knolls to be a camp spot, things like that, it's hard to argue with that. It's an open space. Um, I'm sure we've all laid down in the grass before, so that one makes sense to me, but parking spaces, um, you know, that's, that, that's something that has an intended use and allowing for something to interact upon that. People still probably could, but for us to make allowances for that, I would say shy away from. Um, and then it's for the property owner allowing on their space. Um, I think we need to tie that into our nuisance code. We already have some spaces in there that denote things like that, like the RV for a two week period. Um, but I think we should tie it into our nuisance code because our nuisance code is what holds the property owner accountable for what they're allowing on their space. Um, and I think that's already a mechanism that's available to us. So taking advantage of that's a very smart play, um, which leads into, uh, well, I'll say that for council comments later, but I'm gonna make a request to, to look at being given some permissions to come up with some improvements to make that easier in tandem with staff. And that's it. I think. Right. Right. You're in the hot seat. I have nothing. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, Administrator Brown, um, in rereading this while we sit here, and I warned you that I might think of more things, um, when you say public property, 
are you including the county, the state, the fairgrounds, uh, DHS, or just city property? Just city. I wonder if we should define that. Any city owned property? Okay. Um, and I've been thinking about the intro, and I pulled up HB 3115 again, and of course now I click on the wrong button. And it says relating to the regulation of public property with respect to persons experiencing homelessness. And that's how they introduced their bill. So I wonder if we should put that in our introduction. But in the title, and this is me thinking out loud, uh, I don't know if we can actually refer to the HB 3115, uh, but it, we could say uh, set up unsanctioned. What's it? Something? Unsanctioned. Unsanctioned, unsanctioned sheltering is. Um, Regarding acts of sitting, lying, sleeping, keeping warm and dry outdoors on public property is what they're talking about. So would that be too long of a definition? Or mm -hmm. a title? <laughs> okay, so what would be a good um, summary of that? Um, what about other people called theirs? The majority are going under camping ordinances and Oh, we had the precedent on not using the word camping. Right, so. And Jody did not, excuse me, former Administrator Fritz did not want us to use the word camping, which is very specific that we should use sitting, lying, sleeping, keeping warm, dry outdoors on public property, because she sees camping as a problem for zoning. Um, Would we be better off then making this into something that just says the word like sheltering and then including the RV ordinance portion of our code that states for property owners and just have that as an additional that's included because it's reiterating that same that, subject line. I think we are going to have to codify, once we approve this, we're going to have to codify our other ordinances to not be in conflict, but that happens frequently in life. So how about um, sheltering for the unhoused on public property? Or unsheltering for the homeless on Unsheltered housing. Unhoused un un <laughs> <laughs> un sheltering. Unhoused uh, un 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 sheltering. Unhoused Persons experiencing homelessness sheltering. Sheltering on public property. That better? Well, it's uh, unsheltered. It's unsheltered on public property. Unless you put a tent, then I guess it's sheltered. Okay. We'd have to make a separate section for on private spaces then. Everybody so, think about um, a new title. Space. If we don't come up with one, this is it. Um, okay, so my other suggestions so are, it, um, and I emailed these ahead so that she would have them writing. Yeah. Um, so this is a suggested sentence to add somewhere. Each property allowing camping overnight must provide the city with an emergency contact phone number and backup if owned by an entity and not a private citizen. This contact is to handle any issues with the campers during their stay. And I think we did use the word campers, right? The people camping? For what you wrote? No, for this part. Yeah, authorized camping and storage. Um, I believe you used camping in your part. Yeah, six. Occupy a campsite. Camping so you didn't use the word camp. So that's why I used that word. We may want a different word. Yeah. Um, and the reason I wanted that was, and maybe we should make this a permit for private other than our property. Um, maybe one of those permits where we waive the fee so that if a church comes to us and says, we want to do this, okay, great. On this form, we need to know who we're going to contact if there's a problem. And because I don't want us to become the security department. And that's my next sentence is the police department will not provide security for any facility and will only handle criminal activity and investigation. Each property is responsible for its own security and to keep peace between guests and neighbors. So the camp, that's the word, guests. It's the campers. Yeah, because oh. they're on their property, guests, yeah. Um, and then bathroom facilities are to be provided for urination and defecation by all persons permitted by the person in charge on the property. I don't want people going to the bathroom everywhere. If you're going to allow somebody to be on your property, you need to make sure they can use your facilities. 
and then um, mayor does that include the uh, garbage somebody needs to take care of it now does that place us with the situation of if you say this is an area so you map it you say this is an area that would be allowed for it we'd have to put Bathroom facilities. Oh, she's talking about facilities. private. I'm talking about private and churches and businesses that want to do this. Not our but properties. I understand that, but very much I can see the state or anyone really pushing to say that, well, now you've got a set of double standards versus private ownership and public. And We're not authorizing people to stay there. We're just saying we yeah. can't stop you yeah. from staying there. There's a difference. These are people that are saying, I want people to stay here. I want to help them. It's part of my mission in life to help people. So I want to do this. It's different than us who is being told by the state, thou shalt do it. So wouldn't it, would it be best then for us to go ahead and remove all private aspects from this if we want to make a separate section for them? That's fine. But I think moving forward, have them fully separated them as a public space because there's nothing that says we have to allow for it to happen on private properties. That's something for our citizens to make a decision at, at that point. But per the allowances allowed by the state that's forced on us as a public entity, we should be addressing those things because we've got another one coming up that we might have to address. We'll deal with that if it comes. But, um... It, this is part of what the state's wanting us to do. It, and most jurisdictions are allowing up to three campers in a car or an RV on property. In fact, I think there's a law now that you can't even limit it to three. But I, I could be wrong. If our attorney said it was okay, then it's probably okay. But I do like what Councilor Skinner said about the number um, based on density. And then if somebody's there when a business is closed or when a church is open, then the parking doesn't matter. But if it's while they're open, then it does matter because we go into the zoning code. So that's why I'm thinking a permit process would be the easiest. So this is going to be for the people we currently deal with. So this is going to be something that we looked at probably year after year. Could it be every three months? Yeah. It could be. So um, a permit and stuff, I, I understand why you say that, but that's going to be putting even more work on staff in my opinion by having to check things and, and go out and do the process of, okay, yep, you have your dumpster, you have your... Because the other thing we're gonna be working on is a warming shelter, which could also be thrown in here. And you had another idea. So um, I kind of like the idea of having anything dealing with unhoused in one section. That way we don't have to go pull five places. It's harder on staff and it's harder on our citizens and people that are trying to help. So um, the other thing I had a question on is in all of our ordinances, because the council does the ordinance, uh, the city administrator is the empowered person or their designee, and you've got the chief of police. So I think to be consistent with the rest of our code, we need to make it the city administrator. Okay. And then you would designate the chief or the sergeant or somebody. <laughs> 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 So, because we don't have a relationship with the chief. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does. Councilor Skinner. Uh, Administrator Pagano, I'm trying to figure with the, uh, with the, you know, no extra cost that any of this is costing any cities around the state. Um, it seems that putting the permit process on the non-law enforcement staff would be more economical, which is not fair to the people in that office on that side, but the police department has so many critical responsibilities that if we could take by permitting process some, some potential liability from the police being involved, I think that would be beneficial financially and staff-wise. Okay. Um, on the parking space piece of the tents in the parking space, 
it kind of made me think of the state created danger piece, as in parking spaces aren't great places to be because there are cars there. However, in the circumstances that we're in, a parking space on the edge of a lot might be a safer place than another, so I'm okay with leaving the parking spaces in there at the discretion of the property owner. And then the fire piece on number 15, I'm confused by that because of the court case that's permitting the warm and dry, and I don't know how we deal with court cases in process. Our attorney help tells us if we can't have the, the wording and can't enforce the wording. So on number 15 right now with that court case, the attorney's leaving fires in there with a permit? I don't know about the court case you're referring to, but a, there are times of the year in which we can have no fires, period. And then there's times of the year it's pouring down rain, it doesn't matter. Well, and this, the Senate bill expresses states that warming fires are not actually included in the application. But the Senate bill is before the court case that's currently fighting that. Well, it, the, the, the judges issued the statement that said that, that they could keep warm, which did not preclude fires. But I know Medford did their fire thing. Out of Bear Creek, there's no fires during certain times of the year. But, and I think it matters. That's another reason why it would need to be permitted is if you put a fire pit and it's in a safe spot and you're only putting safe stuff in there, that's okay. And if it's not fire safe. But if you're just starting a fire on the grass or on the pavement, you're going to ruin the pavement. You're going to start a fire on the grass and ruin the grass and start something else on fire. So it makes a big difference. Yeah, I definitely think there should be a permit thing. I'm just not sure that we can say no fires. Okay. Well, we can because the burn permits have to be signed by the property owner and the property owner is a city, so we would have to sign off saying you can have a fire. But if it's on personal property, we'd have different regulations and the property owner would have to take out a burn permit. But the court said that the city has to allow people to be warm. And I can find a case that was in there from that, from the less than sense. The less well, sense and I mean, you can take that to the court space, but until they change the Senate bill or House bill, whatever it was, um, you know, you have you have a protection space in there. So if that means in six months when they go through the court case and somebody's like, yeah, you gotta allow a fire, then we're gonna need to look at readdressing that. But I mean, that's that's a that's a I big just, risk to take to allow un un I don't even know what the word is for unsupervised unsupervised fire. But they would in this have to have a permit in the way it's written in number 15. I'm just really, if you can't see in my eyes, I'm just really not wanting to be Grants Pass. Right. So. I love Grants Pass, go caveman. <laughs> but, so in your next question to the legal counsel, ask about the, the fire issue on our property and if we can require a permit and deny a permit based on a court case that Counselor Skinner is going to get to you. Yes, <laughs> on my to-do list. <laughs> okay, is there any other suggestions so that we can get another draft of this at the next meeting? And I think at the next meeting we're probably going to have to pass it in one meeting with an emergency clause so that it'll be in a take effect by July 1. But I, I'm going to preface that with this is still a working draft and we're probably going to have to make more changes to it. But I think we need something in place by July 1. If we do not have something in place, they, people will be able to camp on City Hall, at City Hall, with their tents. It's my least favorite way to pass ordinances. But I don't know any other way. We've been trying to work on this for a year. Um, one last thing. Uh, can we add a line in there that states that um, items omitted does not create the create for like allowance or however you're supposed to say that. I don't want people to be like, well, it's not said one way or the other in here for like omissions. Um, so like a protection in there. Because I can, I can imagine there's some crazy that somebody's going to come up with. Um, so if we like forgot 
to say specifically something um, because of a not quite overlap with like a generality of one of these items in here. I don't want you know, us to have to fight that. Um, so having that omission piece kind of allows for that, and then if we're going to come back and, and start making changes to this, I mean, okay. this is going to be a learning thing at this point because <laughs> yeah, I'll ask Ross about it. Kind of something in there. It's it's. Uh, I'm not sure if they allow you to put that in ordinances. That's usually a contract. That's what I was kind of thinking. But we'll see. That's what attorneys are for. Yeah. Oh, Ross can get you the court case I was talking about. I'll take that off my plate. He'll know which one it is. And it was a second, it was a follow up. If he could give us um, something we can actually include with our packet next month, just to give the council a little more warm and fuzzy feeling that he did look at it, here are the things that he was concerned about that are addressed, something like that. Not actual legal advice, but something that can be published. Okay. Oh, and then the title. Yeah, we gotta work on the title. We can do that. An email, Mr. Bogano. Do we want to plan for having like a executive session before the next meeting for us to just hear and have legal our, counsel's opinion, not maybe from him directly, but so really that know. Administrator Bergano can speak to it with the protections of this is informational, it's Attorney protected, right. Right. and so then we're in the know. Um, obviously, we're not making any decisions at that point or anything like that, so we just come out of that and it's. It would be entirely, um, you know, a paraphrasing of what was said, and folks can have that same piece. So I declare that Councilor Vieira's idea is better than mine. Mix my idea. We'll have an executive session and read a memo from our attorney. <laughs> that will stay confidential. Okay. Okay, there's nothing else on this matter. Move along. If anybody gets an idea during the month, please email uh, or call Councilor Pagano or Administrator Pagano and, um, so that he can make that part of what he presents. Okay, uh, next is an urban renewal appointment. I couldn't remember how to do these, and thank you for the Administrator Pagano looked up how we did it last time, and apparently I appoint you over. And I don't know how we did that, but we did. So it's Anna Marie Curtis. Uh, I think most of you know her. Yeah. Um, she used to be the uh, business outreach coordinator for Coach Main Street, and she now, I believe, is working for the library. And she included her application. Any questions from the council? How many open seats are there on the APUR? And there may be a third. One so this would bring it down to one or two? Yeah. We're still very short. Am I correct? I, yeah. Cool. Did Jordan move? Okay. So I think Ms. Wagner might not be coming. She has a very important job now. <laughs> She'll be at budget on Wednesday. You can ask her on Wednesday. There you go. Okay. Yeah, then we'll know. <laughs> so, would anybody have any concerns if I did appoint, make the appointment? Um, I just have a question on, and it, it never prevents me from looking positively on someone's intent to, to serve on a volunteer space. But I do have just a minor concern that. Um, I, I don't see Main Street listed as a as a reference piece, and so I, I know a lot can't be said about any of that stuff. I don't want to pry into people's personal business, but I also want to know going in to take certain aspects with a grain of salt, or to be able to assist in saying, "Hey, um, you know, we're about to talk about Main Street's piece. You're welcome to contribute." on certain parts of it, but you might want to recuse yourself from insert option A or something of that nature. Right. Um, she did use a current board member and a former board member as her references. All <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> on there. Which, right? yeah. 
I found interesting. And I had the same concern. Yes. Okay. There's a recent separation, but it is an advisory position, not a decision making position. Right. It also has Sherry Stewart on there. She she runs the entire state program for Main Street. Right. Perfect. Okay. Um, then I am going to appoint Emily Curtis um, to the Urban Renewal Agency if there is a motion and a second to approve. <coughs> Approve your appointment with Emory Curtis to the URA Advisory Council. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Motion from Councillor Bradley, seconded by Councillor Vieira. Uh, any discussion? Call the question. Councillor Bradley. Aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous decision. Um, next up. Uh, we added something. So we have a dangerous building that's almost come down. I don't know where it is. Maybe it is down. Uh, the city owns a lot that most of the building was on free clear. The other lot still has a large cloud on it. And so one of the concepts is that the lot that has the cloud on it could just stay public parking. As long as there's never a little loan on it, then it really doesn't matter that much. It's likely not enforceable, um, but it makes the heart, it very difficult to sell. And then there's the most of the lot where the building was. I believe some of that overlaps. Um, I'm not a surveyor, but if I understand correctly, it overlapped a little bit on the other lot. Um, that one could be sold or leased or something. And I'm thinking that might make a good urban renewal project. Um, because that's what urban renewal districts do. And so my thought was to talk to the urban renewal agency, which you happen to know them, uh, and see if they would be interested in taking that on as a project. And then a proposal would go out to the community of anybody that wanted to uh, purchase the property, do a project on the property, had ideas for the property, and have them actually apply and submit their proposals. And the Urban Renewal Agency would pick the proposals that meet the largest number of goals in the plan. Our Urban Renewal. Right. So if, if somebody met three of the goals and everybody else only met one um, and, and the dollars were all similar, then that would probably be the one that you would pick. Um, one of the things I'm proposing is that whoever does apply puts their own skin in the game and that we require a percentage of their own money to be part of the project. Uh, I say that because a lot of times people that come in with only grant and loan money, none of their own money, it fails. And that's why the candle thing failed. It was one of those Ponzi scheme type things where it, they didn't put much of their own money in it and got a bunch of grants and failed. And I don't want to see that happen again. And so I actually wrote it up and it kind of cheesy. And he even did a sample of application mm -hmm. and a really bad grind. But I, I think you get the idea of what I'm thinking. And if the council and then the Urban Renewal Agency likes the idea, they both have a budget committee meeting on Monday or Wednesday, and that could be put into the budget if you wanted to do that. So um, would you like to start, Mr. Brett? No, I like what you threw out here. I think it's pondering it, I think it's probably the most efficient way that we get something done other than the empty lot over there. It also gets our community involved in coming up with it. It's not just thrown at us, because if it was just us, you know how our town works. Is we love them, but we come up with, if we came up with the idea, someone's going to be unhappy. <laughs> and I like that. I like that the community comes and we approve. It also feels more appropriate to do it that way as a, a government entity is letting the community kind of guide the project and us just kind of being there doing the thumbs up and thumbs down if it meets criteria that we already have in place. Okay. I really like the idea of a rubric tying the urban renewal goals. Um, I like. I like it a lot. Thank you, Nan. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, 
I'm still I'm looking here fast because I didn't read it first. So you were talking about the split of how somebody would be. So it would be 100,000 from ERA, 200,000 from ERA. Where did you have it? What was your thinking? Could you say again on the funding that someone would need to bring to the table? I think they need to bring a percentage to the table. And I'm thinking somewhere around 25 percent, which is pretty minimal in business. Um, and then the rest can be loans and grants. Um, if we work with somebody, it's possible to partner with Main Street. Um, there, you know, CCD has opportunities. There's small business, SBA loans, and things like that that can be partnered with it. Um, and my suggestion is for the urban renewal budget to basically pay the city back for what they've got and invested, and maybe use a little bit of money to help seed the project if we need to. We hope never to have to do it, but sometimes we have to be the catalyst. see the need to specifically state out that we want the money to the side already without looking at a proposal already, like design into us. I think it's great for people to discuss it um, if there's ideas being thrown out from members of the council, the mayor, anyone. Um, you know, I stated that last time. I think public input, or just as much part of the public as anyone else, um, is something that we should collect. But I, I would not want to say we're going to earmark a certain amount of monies and then find ourselves with someone presenting a great opportunity that we want to fund and then dealing with that hurdle. Um, you know, the money's not already set to the side, it's just existing there. So, um, I mean, I don't, is there any benefit really to earmarking that money or would it just present itself in the same fashion if we were to collect proposals from folks? Uh, the biggest difference would we have to do a uh, Supplemental. Supplemental budget, which is our former administrator's way of doing everything. <laughs> um, we actually have to do a supplemental budget for the work we did do. So, um, but that's all coming out of the city's general fund and nuisance fund. So, if we basically made an urban renewal project, urban renewal could either pay it back with cash or if they don't have enough cash, could make a payment plan to the city. So, the city would be made whole and then we could use because we don't have enough money in our nuisance fund to even pay for what we did, so we're going to have to borrow it from somewhere. So I'm suggesting we're going to borrow it. Um, but yeah, if it's too soon to talk about it, we can just do a supplemental budget next year and figure it out. I mean, I would be happy to say we want to say, as like if Urban Renewal decided to do it, um, to put a small chunk of change to the side to say you want to go out and, and, and reach out to folks a little bit to say, hey, you know, this is what we have here, this is what we're hoping to see in there. Um, and that kind of stuff, and that could tie into part of our public outreach. Um, and we said, okay, we want to spend a little bit of urban renewal money on that. I think that falls under the goals of urban renewal. It says, hey, we've got a space. We want to see something in here. These are our ideas of what we want to see in there. Um, if you want to present us something and you need monies, we have X amount of dollars that is in existence for urban renewal. These are the 
what kind of projects we fund. I think that all kind of ties in. So I'd be happy to make a budget line item that says, you know, like a public outreach in specificness to that lot. But I would not want to put $100,000 here straight up. So that means the city wouldn't get their money back. It'd be a city project. The city has how much in it? Do you remember? Which right now we only have our purchase price. Huh? Right now we only have our purchase price in it. But we also have a contract. Right. For. Um, I don't know. Right around there. We're we're out at least one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. And after you include the legal fees and other stuff, we're up quite a bit. Right. So that's going to put our nuisance fund at $100,000 $100, in the hole. It'll take a long time to pay that back. Um, I understand that, but I, and if we want to figure out a way to pay for portions of that, in my mind, the idea is to see a project go in there, but the idea was to sell that lot correctly and have something occur there. And then the city would get paid back. Okay. Well, but we also don't want to sell it to somebody that's going to land make it and not build on it. Right. Well, I mean, yes, but the entirety of the intent was to remove a dangerous building. So at okay. the end, end of the day, I mean, it's an opportunity, don't get me wrong, to do something. But the intent of the removal was this is dangerous, this is bad for us, we need to see it go, and then to go forward from there um, is, is to do that piece. Um, as landowner, if we say, hey, if you submit a proposal with it on what you're doing, that's better, but um, the moment you sell it over to someone and they choose not to do it outside of funding their purchase, um, you kind of lose a lot of that power there, um, other than saying, hey, we're going to revoke your access, or uh, you can't really do that. But I don't like the idea of, of the city giving itself money and, and doing this like money transfer thing. Um, you know, it was something that was discussed when the decision was made, um, was what are we going to do with it, how are we going to return that money to us, and getting it from somewhere other than just transferring funds around within the city. It's still a, a space that's lost in there. And if I may bring it back to urban renewal is designed to increase the tax base. Right. So oh, we get a higher tax base. Well, a, in that sense, it's a right. perfect urban renewal. Right? Well, absolutely. And that's, that's why I, I brought up <clears throat> budgeting for outreach. Um, I think that's 100% within the scope of what's expected of us is to say, hey, let's see if we can get someone to come in and do something. But to start setting parameters for that straight up again, I don't think it's where we want to be. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor Madison. I don't have anything there. Thank you. Good idea, bad idea? I honestly, um, like it was mentioned, it seems a little early. I didn't know if there had been any internal conversations within the city, if there's any ideas that would help um, our infrastructure. Um, I, I certainly like the track that we're on. I don't have any, I don't have any um, opinion either way whether or not we dedicate a certain amount of that funding or if we just do a supplemental. Okay. But I do like the idea of putting it out to the community because I know a lot of them ask, so. As far as putting it in a budget, are we about to analyze everything for discuss that? That's why I wrote this on April 20th. <laughs> but I miscommunicated with the administrator so it didn't get to you guys early. <laughs> but I do, it's very well thought out, and I appreciate the time you put into that. So, um, hearing the feedback, I'm going to suggest that we put this on the next urban renewal meeting and discuss it again. And then go from there, uh, Councilor Schmidt. I'm just playing my first year in a few months, in a couple months in this. So, the demolition costs, that's your contract. So, is there not a way that we could? Just use some 
that we're not in the urban renewal agency meetings are some urban renewal monies for that. I know you're talking about transferring things from one place to another, but if the city of Bull Beach is assisting the urban renewal zone to increase property values. Basically, my suggestion is just basically sell it to the urban renewal agency. I don't know if the agency actually owns something or if the city owns it on their behalf. So the urban renewal agency can do a project there to guarantee something to be built. Councilor Is there a way we could leverage um, urban renewal dollars with Main Street to see if maybe they can land a grant for something to go there? Right. And that's why I was suggesting we get people to bring us ideas. Once we get the idea that everybody likes, then that's the one that Main Street and whoever else might help. I think CCD would be a good partner. And you've had a couple people contact you, right, with ideas. So Several, not just a couple. One of the benefits of me not actually being on the urban renewal agency is I can actually do that. I can go out there and talk to people and and and, and I'm not a decision maker so I can't influence the decision. Um, which is kind of nice. It was one of my benefits because we talked about whether or not we should change it. Uh, when I was on the urban renewal agency I actually did need to get into those conversations and I felt really bad because it's kind of crossing that line of ethics. But I never benefited from anything so i got a puzzle book over here. Yeah, because I'm still coming back to the idea that we have a big project that the city started because it was a dangerous building. And then the cost and the amount of time they spent chipping away at rebar and concrete and the costs are going. Is there a way, and you can get back to me later, like it seems like that's what some of our urban renewal monies could be spent on. So I understand what you're saying about transferring things from one place to another and that being a hesitancy, but it seems like without even this proposal, it seems like that's something that that money could be used for. Like that's the intent to raise the property values and taking that down, raise the property values of that hotel next door and the place across the street. So you oh, can, um, it would just be redoing, it would be in a supplemental budget for urban renewal. But we're struggling our budget this week. Right, but that will be for the next fiscal year. We'll be paying this bill before next fiscal year. So we have already established our budgets for both. Both, yeah. So we'd have to just do a supplemental. I mean, you can pay that bill out of urban renewal funds currently. You would just have to do a supplemental budget to address that. Okay. So Which we have to do anyway for the regular budget. Well, we don't have to do anything with urban renewal right now. Right. So we just do a supplemental on both budgets. No big deal. That would just be up to you guys to decide what you want to do. Did you have a comment, sir? Okay. Come on, usually you're very worried. I, I mean, I have, people are very excited about what's going to happen, but I haven't heard of a single great idea going forward. Oh, you haven't heard of mine? Exactly right. That's what my mouth shut. I was told we should just turn it into a park and make it an enclosed pickleball court. <laughs> no, so we want tax Could money. we serve pickles? We've already done all right. So, uh, with that, I think we've, we've beaten this idea long enough to know it needs to go on another meeting. And thank you very much for letting me add that and discuss it. And what was your comment, sir? <laughs> I deleted it. Uh, <clears throat> Administrator Pagano's comments. I know you have some. Uh, update on CTR. So we are in contract. We have secured our contract. Everything's been signed. So we're in escrow on that. So, so it's no property longer, that the city's purchasing. It's no longer private. Every, I mean, the stuff we talked about in executive session probably don't discuss. But yes. Uh -huh. So we are in escrow on it, and you can disclose now that we are. Um, so that's a good. That was a plus. We had an update from ODOT on our bike grant. And we are being recommended for approval for our grant in full. So that's exciting. So we are, we are approved through them. We just have to have the final go through, final approval. So we got through the first round, the second round, we're in the third round? We're, we're done. We're being recommended for approval. Okay. It's just that they say, OK, good. We just have to wait till they actually approve it. So, so that's exciting. We got the full amount on that. So that can start as soon as we get it. And that's the bikeway between the port and us. Yes. Okay. 
that's in our urban renewal plan. Yep. And still, they're still working on the audit. We're not <laughs> getting much progress there. I don't know what's going on. That's about all I got. It's been busy. It's been a very, Park. very busy. Oh, parks. We've had a bunch of parks meetings. Um, things are going good. If you haven't been down there, go down there because it looks a heck of a lot better already just from a one week of having our new guy there. Um, I'm still waiting on getting bids back for the bathrooms, but those will move forward as soon as we do. And that's about it. I think uh, there's probably more. I don't remember. Since this is the first time we're talking in public about the property in Hunter Creek, um, what is your next step? It's a phase one. Phase one environmental to make sure it's okay for housing. And then if that's a go, then we have to probably have it surveyed. Yep. And we're probably going to do that with the fact that we need to do a lot line adjustment, a right. zone change, and a minor partition if we move forward. Yep. And okay. all of it will be done through escrow. Extremely complicated. <laughs> It'll all be done through escrow, so that's why we gave ourselves such a long time frame. Okay. And that time frame was? 365 days. <laughs> 365 days. And we can't mention the amount, right? Because that's still confidential. But it's within what the council authorized. Well, the council should know. We've told them before. Okay. But I wouldn't talk about the purchase price. Yeah. Okay. It was a good deal. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Counselor. Oh, oh, and we had nine and a half inches of rain last month. <laughs> Came through, come through uh, Ron Sing in the email today, so. Okay, how much do we usually have? Not that much. Okay. Nine and a half in March is a lot, or in April is a lot. Okay. Dancer Mads? Okay. Wild horse is still packed with snow, so that's good. The snow melt will be good for the salmon on the rogue and for fires, I think, so I'm happy about that. Okay, I have three to five minutes. Event center on the beach. So their engineer of records also acting as their project manager, which is wonderful. It means that a lot of things are going to happen a lot quicker because that's their sole focus, unlike the rest of us. Um, they've even taken on um, the project management for the EV charging station, so I'm really happy about that. Um, the theme for this year's fair is fun for the whole herd. They've also decided on a grand marshal. Um, I don't know if they've made that public yet, but it's good stuff, of course. Commercial kitchen. I got a tour last week. Um, oh my gosh, great work being done there. And I really appreciate how frugal they are with their spending and doing what they can on their own so that they can save more of that for the capital investments. Um, they've moved walls, um, the electrical's been upgraded, plumbing's been resecured, the new walk-in cooler um, was um, built out with labor donated just to stretch the impact of that. Um, a commercial 12 burner stove, two convection ovens, a massive cooktop grill. Also the service layout's been um, reconfigured for more efficient use of that space and access. Um, let's see. Uh, Trish is back. They had a position, part-time position open, um, but Trish was able to come back, which is great because she already has the experience uh, and the knowledge, which is less of a hardship on the event center as a whole. Um, let's see. Oh, um, so um, Curry County's uh, economic development is working in partnership with the event center on bringing uh, AV into the showcase building. Um, and we actually got, um, staff got in touch with Jeremy at the library because we we know that's a really great system and we wanted to know, you know, what we can do to make it happen quicker because what I'm seeing is that a lot of the events offered countywide are being put down as lock and I'm not going to ask people in Porterford to travel that far. And so, um, so looking to uh, drop some, some funding into that and make it happen as quick as possible. And by the time the convention center is built out, it will be integrated equipment anyway. So, and bring them some more revenue. It will, though. <laughs> um, it, and if not, we'll just put it somewhere else. But, um, you know, that way it's going to help generate some more revenue. It's going to be easier for those of us looking for a meeting space locally to have some options. And 
less travel time for being the county seat. I feel like we should have something. Uh, I feel like a lot of pressure on the library too. Um, that is all I have, I think, on that. But I was just going, whoever put this um, annual report for Walter Rivers Coastal Lands on my spot, thank you. Uh, looking through this, I, I was just curious. I saw that um, there was um, grantee funding for Main Street, and um, one of the deliverables on that says it's completed the downtown pocket park, which looks really great. Um, adding weather resistant benches and murals. Do we have murals down there yet? And if so, do we know where that's going to go? At the pocket park? Yeah. Do we just have murals the, down there? Just the black building. And the last I heard, the building wouldn't cooperate, so they were talking about it across the street. I don't think they've that either. Okay, so murals like on adjacent. Maybe that's why they have 10,000 left over. Yeah, could be. Oh, that could be. Yeah. They uh, are flexible with their grants. And then the other thing. I just felt negligent if I didn't know those murals. Um, the other thing that they had funded was um, the um, Gold Beach uh, Community Garden, and I didn't know if that was the one in our city park or if this is a new one. The Gold Beach Main Street did? No. No, well, no, Wild Rivers Coastal Oh, Lines. sorry. <laughs> I know we did. We funded it. But we ran to the juvenile department, but I don't know. Okay, so th I was wondering, did it transfer over or management or responsibility? Um, that's on page 11 of the mayor. There's also one going in at the fairgrounds. Maybe that's it. Oh, okay. the professional gardeners or whatever they're called. That master, right? master. master gardeners. Yeah, they could have given money to those. Oh, um, they are building a greenhouse, aren't they, at the fairgrounds? I think so. Yeah. yeah, they're building a greenhouse with the programs, maybe it is that. No, they're saying it's Oasis Advocacy Shelter established a community garden. Right. For survivors, that's not ours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe yeah, it's at the shelter. That's a shelter. So it's not, it's not a community, community garden, it's only for them because nobody can enter that site. So community is a so it led me to stretch. Question: Do we have any updates on the community garden? I've only seen it from afar, from the softball field lately. It's very wet. <laughs> There's yeah. something wrong with our drainage. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with our drainage. Okay. And so when uh, Wendy went in there, it was that deep of water. She was soaked. She fell in the mud. Uh, but um, he's getting it fixed. <laughs> so sh they're still actively. <clears throat> yeah, they've got grants to do above ground beds. Awesome. I'm yeah. really glad to hear they're still in the No progress yet, but they are supposed to be making progress. Cool. They're still committed. I like to hear them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all I have. Councilor Redley. I um, only had one, had one interaction with, uh, he's not technically with Inside City Limits, but I have known him and helped him on a project and he's trying to expand. He was asking me questions about annexation and maybe getting help from the county. I refer him to you, Mr. Cardano, um, to Parky. Hasn't called yet. No. I'll hit him up because it's actually, I've seen, seen what he has in vision and it'd be helpful. He is with it. I do believe that property is in urban growth boundary. It's right next to the mill site. Mm -hmm. Just before Endicott Gardens. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. So that means he hasn't contacted you, so. Yeah. No. It's a small little manufacturing park. He oh, wants yeah. To expand. Okay. I mean, he's got a. I can't remember the acreage. He's got a big empty lot in the back that he wants to expand and put in. Oh, I know. The more the merrier. Send them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have another have an update on the yeah. sewer going out there, the, the feasibility study? I, they are working on the feasibility study now. Okay. And we did throw some numbers up to the state because they asked for them. Yes, I, I put in. Senator Smith asked for numbers, so we gave him numbers. So it's possible to have miracle money for us. I asked for a lot of money. There'd be something at the feasibility study, and all of a sudden we have money to do it. To fund the That would really add to the housing. Every place up there, yep. they're limited by their septic. And then right after I submitted that one, then Representative 
voice asked for the same thing. Yeah. So maybe we will get somewhere. I don't know how it works. Thank you. Dr. Mm -hmm. Skinner. Well, I have a state executive branch update. The Oregon Health Authority's five-year Curry Health Assessment Survey is still open. The last number I saw was 320 as far as responses. Um, my personal goal is like 800, but I didn't have stats, and Mayor keeps telling me that 400 is an applicable sample pool. But we are still looking for more people. Um, there's a QR code on there. I'm happy to email you the survey, but please reach out to people. We do have a little incentive. There are 10 um, $100 gift cards being given away to respondents. Um, so please, that's still open. I'm not sure when they're going to close it. Actually, wait, it's May 1st. They might have closed it yesterday, but I don't know. I didn't see an email this morning saying it was closed. Um, so that was good to see that engagement, and I heard good response of the um, not listening sessions, the groups of people they gathered together to talk about health in Curry County. And so they had one here in Gold Beach too, and I just can't think of what that's called. Focus group, focus group on health. Um, the Hopefully you've seen a little bit so far. We have a big mental health event coming up next week, the 12th and 13th. Uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, their Southern Oregon chapter out of Jackson and Josephine County. They're coming over to sponsor because it says Southern Oregon in their title, so I thought they would be a good partner with ADAPT, the county mental health provider. So they're sponsoring a workshop. Friday night is an event on mental health hygiene for everybody, community-wide. Um, it's a dinner at the event center. Um, with a facilitator who train, who facilitates groups for NAMI and DBSA, which is the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance up in Portland. She does a lot of work with NAMI Oregon. She actually trains facilitators, so we're getting like the best of the best to come down here. And then, so that is seated up to 70 individuals, and you can RSVP with ADAPT. Um, I can give you more information too. And then on Saturday, there is a peer support workshop for people who are navigating mental health um, conditions, so there'll be a group of just about 20 people at the library um, to talk about um, peer support groups. Peer support groups are a big part of mental health recovery. And so that's the mental health piece. Um, the Lee of Oregon Cities Conference and was great. I encourage you all to go to the fall conference or the next regional events they have. We have a Lee of Oregon City small meetings here. We're hosting May 18th here, 10 to 1. 11 to 1. So please mark your calendar for that. Um, but I'm happy to talk to any of you about what I did at League of Oregon Cities. Just reach out. Um, school outreach went well. I was with the fifth grade again last week talking about the elected, the staff, and the volunteers that make the city run, um, that help the city run. And on that note, I'm Excited to see the community engagement that we've had with the budget committee with people applying, with the new applicant to the urban renewal, and I'm liking to see, I would love to see more of that. And I did, oh, on the outreach, I didn't get your emails. Do we currently have a student liaison seat open? Uh, we do. I did not mention it, but um, Mr. Zen has not responded to me yet, and okay. he's never asked to be excused from a meeting, so I think he just goes to this. So please keep your ear out for any high schooler or eighth grader going into high school that might be interested in that role. Um, and then my last note is energy conservation, please. I am still um, in conversation with Coos Curry about promoting energy conservation. That just really, uh, those wind energy conversations that really just came to the forefront for me that we've, a lot of us have stopped talking about energy conservation. And so I'm really excited about um, doing something with Coos Curry to encourage energy conservation. And there's things the city can do as well. There were multiple people at the League of Oregon Cities Conference um, talking about such things. Thank you, guys. Councilor Vieira. Mine's short. Uh, fishing is great. <laughs> good. It's great. Um, and you, you ask any of the, the guides, they're going to tell you the same way. Um, Unofficial numbers from a few gentlemen out of um, ODFW. They're looking at staggering numbers of um, hatchery fish showing up. Um, generally, you look at when you go fishing, um, they would be reporting more um, more wilds than, than hatchery in a lot of different cases and. 
like I said, an official from ODF, but also um, through some boots on the ground surveying at the docks. Um, it sounds like everybody is getting themselves quite a bit of um, hatchery fish. And it's my understanding that up towards Grants Pass, there's a hatchery space up there that had received a new uh, manager or I don't even know what his official title is. And I can't remember his last name now either. Um, but he came in and was a bulldozer of, I've got changes I want to see, these things we can improve on, and all this other stuff. And so I'm hopeful that what we're seeing now is uh, in direct correlation to what he's doing. And maybe that will involve more of our rivers, seeing this kind of improvement. Um, Everybody be ready for more people this summer to be in Gold Beach with the closing of the, uh, the Oceanscape. I suspect we're going to see probably record numbers of people out there fishing the bay, especially this fall. Um, it, it's ironic that we had our uh, boater safety period out here, and it's, it's almost as if the Coast Guards even know that <laughs> we're probably going to be looking at uh, record numbers of boats out there. Um, so if you go out there and know someone that's going out there, please remind them to be safe. Um, boats aren't bumper cars, despite how much we try to do that. Uh, additionally to that, actually, I've got random junk to ask about, so it's not even useful. Um, I would like to ask the council if it would be in our interest, if anyone, um, I'd be happy to put in a, a fair bit of time I'm familiar with our nuisance code. Um, and it is a subject that in the past has been pushed back um, with just kind of haphazard notifications um, and requiring to do muni court and all this other stuff to really um, see some change from folks. And um, as, as a counselor, I've received things from folks that say, hey, you know, we'd really like to see these things, and um, and I, I mentioned this to Mr. Pergano when he, he mentioned that maybe there would be an opportunity to work together on putting something together and then presenting that to the council. Um, but I figure it's probably best to ask for a little bit of permission that, uh, one, you guys are aware, and if you have an idea, um, I'd be happy to retain that and then present that so we don't waste any staff time at that level. Okay. Um, do you know if we have that in a word document? Are you okay? Yeah, what? Do you know if we have the nuisance code in a word document? Uh, it's just easier to make comments in it if, if it is. You can also do it in a PDF now. I know we have PDF. I'm not sure if it's in Word. Yeah, it's maybe one of the older ones. ones. I've always wanted to revise it. And one of the things I wanted to put in the enforcement section is, if we remind you every year, yeah. you're getting fined. <laughs> it's like we tell the same people every year, the land bankers, to take care of their property. Every year, yeah. And it's ridiculous. It's like, put it on a service and just keep it worked on. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think it's going to be an opportunity for us to have, um, it's not going to per se cover all of staff time working on it, but, um, you know, you're already committing the staff time to go out there and, and look at that stuff and, and writing letters and, and all this mumbo jumbo. So, um, if that results in us having a backstop of money that sits in a code enforcement thing, um, then you know the discussion we had earlier with the urban renewal fund idea is something that we can already start placating um, before it ever even happens. So we're we're ready for the next one, uh, and that way we can point at this and say, hey, we learned a lesson and we made these improvements. So when the next one comes around, we're Rick Barron and we can mess something else up and get yeah, that. And that's it. Cool. Um, I'm going to accent um, May 18th. If you guys, and if you all work, could make time to come to the small cities meeting, uh, Administrator Pergano volunteered to host it several months ago. You weren't even the administrator yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they took us up on their offer. Um, Oregon Housing and Community Services is going to come down. I know for sure, almost out of time, I know for sure that um, Kim Travis is coming from there. 
Um, I met with Director Bell from OHCS at the Spring Symposium. Um, I was really quite shocked she wanted to talk to me, and it's because we made a name for ourselves with that award. That she wanted, she was coming to Keys Bay, she couldn't make it to Pebble Beach, so she wanted to meet with me. So, um, if you don't know who OHCS is, they're our, our funding source for housing in, in Oregon. So the fund, federal money funnels through there. So it is a great opportunity for us to learn about what they do, and we may even be able to get a meeting um, with her to kind of talk about the projects we want to do. I'm trying to get them to give us some flexible money for our workforce housing, that would be 80% to 200% of our area median income, which is like, and I got to do the numbers, it's like two people working minimum wage with no kids, and you hit the 100%. So um, it's hard for people to find housing in that level. And we've got a lot of ideas of how we're going to do that. But if we could come up with some funding ideas, um, they're the ones that can do it. And there's, there's another project that housing authority is thinking about doing, but they're probably not going to use state money. So um, I enjoyed the conference. I'm exhausted from being gone and working too. I think everybody forgets that I, work, I have a full-time business, including myself, and I do more <laughs> work myself. And I'm like, why am I so tired? Oh, it's because I started at 7 and I'm finishing at 11. So <laughs> everybody else is out having a good time in socializing, except for you who is also working. So um, anyway, I appreciate um, the council. I appreciate our staff. And um, I was a little bit testy with 